Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Richard Besser, who is the senior medical correspondent at ABC. And uh, he's offered to juggle for us, actually, for the afternoon lunch crowd. So we might have to hold him to that. It's, it's usually a challenge being the first, first speaker after lunch, because I know how, how I usually feel at that point. So yeah, if it gets a little slow, if I see the heads falling, <laughs> I'm going to juggle these water bottles for you. There, we there go. you go. That's his commitment yeah. to all of us. <laughs> So I'm really excited to have Rich here on the stage with me because I'm the community manager for the UN Foundation's Million Moms Challenge, and Dr. Besser was actually one of the really powerful forces behind getting this off the ground when we first started in September 2011. Right. And it's a partnership between ABC and the UN Foundation, and your voice as part of that has just been incredible. So we thank you, and we're thrilled to have you here. I, I, I think... Um a project like that, that that really builds from the grassroots is what's so critically important for, for global health. You you know, if, if, if our leaders, if our politicians don't feel that the public cares about the issue, then it makes it so much easier to, to cut any kind of support for, for these activities. Exactly, and, and it's funny because we, we were just chatting a little bit before backstage and you were talking about the power of storytelling as we look at the, the issues of health, and it's really easy to throw data at you, and certainly we may do that as we talk this afternoon, but, but this idea of storytelling and us here in the audience as being part of that storytelling yeah. process. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I still do that as part of, of, of my, my life, um, but I spent most of my career at the CDC doing public health, do, as an epidemiologist, doing studies, uh, doing projects around the world, and it's such important work. Um, but what I learned uh, about four years ago during the flu pandemic was the power of communication to change behavior. And when I had the opportunity to, to come to ABC News, um, it struck me that using stories, um, you can convey so much information that people hold on to in a way that's very different from reading a report or some of the mind-numbing statistics. You know, when you when you when you hear that you know 800 women die in, in pregnancy every day, well, that's that's a big number. Uh, when you hear about millions of children dying in, in in the first five years of life, that's that's a mind-numbing number. But when you get to see one of those children and hear their story, then you connect at a different level that is actually much more powerful. And this is something that you actually had quite early in, in your career. You were in Bangladesh yeah. as, a, as a young pediatrician, yeah. and you met a little one who was suffering from whooping cough. Yeah. You know, I, um, I've, I've had many different careers that I was sure were going to be the career I would do for the rest of my life. And um, I figured I was going to be a, a global health doc. I would be in Bangladesh doing work on the ground for the rest of my career. But I had the opportunity um, right after my pediatric training to go to Bangladesh and do research. Well, the, the research was a total bomb. But then I had the opportunity there to go to a rural clinic and work as, as the doctor. And um, I was working, it, it was a, a clinic run by the Marist sisters who do incredible work around the, around the world. And I was working in this clinic and um, we had a little baby come in, nine months old who had whooping cough. And we were six hours from the nearest hospital by boat. And so we had to make do. And we were down to our last oxygen tank. And the question was, would we have enough oxygen for this baby to, to make it? Um, and we did. And, uh, but it struck me that the issue that that mom was faced was that she didn't have access to vaccine. Right. And so that baby was at risk because of that. Then we'll flash forward to, to here uh, for Good Morning America, I, I did a story about a mom here whose baby died from whooping cough. And the idea that someone in America could die from a vaccine-preventable disease, well, this mom did not know mm. that her, she was supposed to get vaccinated during pregnancy. That's a recommendation in the United States. And we've become so comfortable that these diseases are elsewhere that a lot of moms and dads and doctors are delaying vaccination of children. So she had several children who were on kind of a, a delayed vaccine schedule, so they weren't fully protected. And the only way newborns are protected from something like whooping cough is if those around them 
are vaccinated and protected. Well, they'll never know how the baby got infected, but at about two months of age, got whooping cough and died. And just the, the, the power of that story, the bravery of the, uh, of the mom to, to uh, Katie Van Tornhut, she was, she's one of my heroes, because she went out and told her story. And I think because of that, she saved lives, because now moms during pregnancy are asking their doctor, shouldn't I be getting the pertussis vaccine? Mm. Yeah, and that's a story. Yeah, and you actually recently covered the, the, the programs in India to try and eliminate polio. Right, yeah, it, it, we were um, extremely fortunate to get money from the Gates Foundation to cover global health. Yeah. And as part of that, uh, they sent me around the world to tell stories. ABC sent me around the world to mm -hmm. tell stories. And you know, in, in the past, the Gates Foundation had, had supported public TV and, 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 and their work. But what struck them was that a lot of the public TV audience gets it. Right. You know, they're, they're, it's kind right. of the preaching to the choir. Um, but our audience at ABC News gets it a little less. And so by sending me out there, I, w I was able to go to India. It was, in the, it was before they had declared polio eliminated. Right. And to see the infrastructure that they had built to be able to respond whenever there was a, a, a child identified in any village in India with, with uh, paralysis in a limb, they could respond and get there in a matter of hours to do the testing to see, could this be a case of polio? And if so, can we, can we ramp up really quickly vaccination around that child to prevent this from, from spreading and, and, and to help eliminate polio in, in that country? And then, I was able to be there during one of their one day vaccine campaigns mm -hmm. on the train station, one of the train stations. The train would pull in to the platform, right? And this army of, of mainly moms who had been trained how to do this would go up to the windows on the train. People would put down the, put down the, the window, hold their baby out, they'd put some drops in their mouth, and it was done. In about 15 minutes, the train would be out of the station, but all of those babies had been, been vaccinated. They'd it was incredible. Them. And, and these are the kinds of um, radical solutions that have gotten to them to the point where they now, two years on, can say, we are That's polio right. free. That's right. And you know, it's down to, to Nigeria and, and, and Afghanistan, Pakistan area, um, you know, th th where there's still polio. And you know, we need that final push. And, and we need people not to give up with the thought that we, we could finally eliminate another disease. Smallpox, eliminated. Yeah. It would be incredible if we could do it for polio. This close, people. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable to think that we are on that precipice. Yeah. You, um, you've also covered a lot on maternal health stories over your career. Um, but I wonder if you could actually share with us a story that you told me about, again, being a young pediatrician in Bangladesh and not delivering many babies in your life. Yeah. So um, this is kind of what happens when you have an MD after your name. You know, you get the MD and then you're assumed to be the expert on, on anything medical. So I was working at, the, at, this, at this clinic in rural Bangladesh and um, Sister Jenny, who is a family doctor, she'd been working in this clinic for many, many years. She was going on retreat. And um, uh, Sister Shirley, who's a phenomenal nurse midwife, was there. And they said, okay, Sister Shirley's gonna do all of the deliveries unless something comes in that's really complicated, and then you'll do the delivery. Well, I think I had done all of 20 deliveries as a, as a medical student, and I was a pediatrician. And, and, and so um, she said, okay, here's a, you know, you're, you're probably never gonna have to do this, but let me just walk you through how to deliver a breech baby. And she had a little model of a pelvis and a doll. And a, she opened up the textbook and showed me how I was supposed to rotate and reach in and grab for the jaw and pull the head down and this whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, sure, this is, this is really going to happen. But, uh, you know, and I said to Shirley, right, you'll take care of this. And she's like, fine. So Nurse Jenny leaves and, and a woman comes in who had not had prenatal care. And one of the problems you know, if, if you look at, at the statistics, if it's fewer than a third of women around the world get the four prenatal visits that are recommended. Well, this woman had not had prenatal care. Um, thankfully, she was, she was at, you know, at least in the 40-something percent who had a trained birth attendant because she was there and, and mm -hmm. had Shirley and, and me, um, so trained in a little bit. Um, and Shirley examined her and said, I think the baby's breech. And not only was she breached, but, but she was 
uh, uh, which is, means you're backwards. Uh, instead of head down, you're, you're butt down. Instead of just simple butt down, she was what's called a, a, a footling breach, and a double footling breach. So you reached in and you could feel two little feet there, which was not what you're supposed to, supposed to feel. Um, and so we got, you know, Shirley says, all right, you're doing this one. And um, I had, had one of the assistants there get me the book, and she's holding the book, and we're doing the whole thing, and she's putting the pressure, and I'm doing it. And, and uh, the baby came out and let out a little cry. And it was a weak cry. And it's like, I'm a pediatrician. I know what to do with a baby with a weak cry. And you know, they had what you want to see in a clinic. They had, they had oxygen. They had a mask. I was able to resuscitate the baby. And Shirley could take care of the mom. And it turned out great. But for so many women around the world, they don't, even, they don't have that access. Yeah. And that's why it's so, it's so important to, to provide that access. So I want to ask you before we get booted off stage, you just wrote a book called Tell Me the Truth, Doctor. And one of the things that I'm really intrigued about this is you give a lot of advice on how to kind of manage and navigate that relationship with our medical professionals because it can be a little intimidating. You know, my mother's 70 years old. She's never questioned anything a medical professional has told her in her entire life. Yeah. And I don't think she's an outlier. And that's kind of across cultures that often women who are the, the primary voice for yeah. healthcare for their families don't feel empowered to kind of take on that relationship. And I wonder if you could just talk us through some words of wisdom on that part. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's, it's one of the big issues in healthcare. There's this power relationship between the healthcare provider and, and the patient. I mean, my dad's a doctor, and he's, he doesn't ask the questions. He'll come back from his doctor's appointment, and he'll call me and say, here's what he said, uh, and he'll ask me like three questions. And I'll say, did you ask the doc that? He said, no, I thought I'd call you. It's like, <laughs> OK. Uh, but it is a power relationship. It can be very helpful if you have an advocate in the room with you to ask some of those questions, to write things down so that, so that you're getting that information. Um, and, and that can be a peer. I mean, one of the things, one of the stories I was able, we were able to tell for, for ABC was, was of Mothers to Mothers in, in Africa, which is empowering women to help other women. So these aren't skilled healthcare providers, but they're empowering women to go out and get tested for HIV so that if they're positive, they can be treated and they can have a healthy baby. It's a, it's a, a great solution to the problem that it's so hard. In, I mean, it's hard here, but in many countries, it's next to impossible for a woman to go and seek health care if she doesn't have her male relative with her or someone else granting position. Here's a solution around that that's, that's innovative. And there's so many innovative programs going on around the world that need to be supported. And what everyone is doing here in terms of blogging and tweeting um, and, and posting to, to Facebook is so important for getting the message out. It's, it's, uh, you know, because these are stories that are incredibly hard to get major media to cover, but media is changing. You know, I, I did a colon cancer Twitter chat. I have a weekly Twitter chat, ABC Dr. B chat, on Tuesdays. We hit 40 million people with that, with that Twitter chat, which, you know, is, is, you know, almost 10 times what we have on Good Morning America in the morning. You know, you don't know how many people are, are, are seeing that, but even a fraction, it just says the power of social media to, to share information and, and to promote change. I'm going to sneak in one more question. I'm going to get in trouble. I would love to know what your favorite part of being a dad is. You have two teenagers, so just sneak that in there for us. Uh, well, I'm a pediatrician and I'm a dad, and I think what I love most about being a dad is that I get to play. <laughs> and it, it I mean, being a parent, it keeps you young, it keeps you fresh. It, it, you get to see the world through, through fresh eyes again, and I love, not every minute of it, but I, I, I love almost every minute of it. It's wonderful. Honesty is good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.